This is the programme the Scientologists didn't want you to see. They've done all they can to stop it. Why? Because the big story has secretly filmed inside the cult to reveal its bizarre mind control techniques. This man is talking to an ashtray. This 1995 Carlton television documentary on the Church of Scientology provided a rare glimpse into the inner workings of the church through the use of hidden cameras. Watching it, we were left wondering if even half of what has been said about the Church of Scientology is true, its manipulative practices and the way it charges up front for all services, clearly showing it to be a commercial enterprise, why is it still allowed to operate with a tax-exempt religious status in the U.S.? Something is wrong with this picture. Researching it, we realized that far more was wrong than we ever would have thought. What we found was a global pattern of unimaginable abuse and protection of the abusers at the highest levels of governments around the world. This is a story you will likely want to believe is not true, but the evidence for it cannot be easily dismissed. It is a story that will give you a glimpse into the inner workings of more than just Scientology. A glimpse at things that hidden cameras alone won't show you. And it is a story that will change how you see your world forever. So is Scientology a harmless fringe religion, or is it a sinister sect that controls the minds of its members? This is one of the keys to understanding what Scientology is really all about. Mind control. Mind control techniques figure prominently throughout the entire Scientology curriculum, and these techniques bear a striking resemblance to those developed by the CIA around the same time that Scientology emerged. As shown in publications like the now declassified Kubark Counterintelligence Interrogation Manual, Kubark is a CIA codename for the CIA itself. Specifically, the process of Scientology auditing is strangely similar to Kubark Counterintelligence Interrogation. You and a friend will team up together and follow the basic steps of the procedure. This is called auditing, and any two reasonably intelligent people can do it. The term auditing comes from a word which means to listen. Kubark interrogation begins with eliciting, defined as obtaining information without revealing intent or exceptional interest through a verbal or written exchange. On Pool High Street, she's approached within minutes by a young man with a clipboard. Uh. Claiming to promote a book, the young man persuades Ali to go with him to his office to complete a survey. It's 40 minutes before he admits he works for the Scientologists. This is how most people are recruited into Scientology, but they don't know the true beginnings of this so-called science of the mind. Kubark defines the use of polygraphs in interrogation as an aid in the psychological assessment of sources, similar to Scientology's use of the e-meter, which is nothing more than a crude form of polygraph. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pinch you. And I want you to just watch and see what the needle does when I pinch you. Just note it, okay? Okay. Watch. Can yeah. you see that? Yes. Okay, good. Just run through. The e-meter, they believe, helps you uncover repressed thoughts. It didn't take Marty long to find a naughty thought of mine. Scientology literature is filled with code names and acronyms to a degree that is only common in intelligence documents, like the Kubark Counterintelligence Manual. And some of the Scientology training routines seem to even be developed directly from the Kubark Manual. The Scientology training routine TR1 is called Dear Alice. In this training routine, the student is directed to read random phrases from Lewis Carroll's book Alice in Wonderland without showing any reaction to the bizarreness of it. In the Kubark Manual, a confusion interrogation technique is described, entitled Alice in Wonderland. Of course, none of this provides proof that the principles of Dianetics and Scientology are based on CIA counterintelligence techniques. But it does provide evidence that L. Ron Hubbard was both aware of these techniques and willing to use them to gain control and power over others. Notice, for example, how Hubbard echoes the Kubark manual 
which states that detention in a controlled environment and perhaps for a lengthy period is frequently essential to a successful counterintelligence interrogation of a recalcitrant source. Now, I want to give you just a little rundown on what you're walking into. It's too late for you to leave. I mean, uh, rolled. You know, it's quite customary for somebody to say, well, if you don't like this, you're here on your self-determinism and all that sort of thing, and you don't like this, why, well, it's volunteer, you know, and you can leave and so forth. We don't do that around here. You're in, you're done. <laughs> so, we well, just close the gates right at that point. There are countless descriptions of Scientology's use of hypnosis and mind control techniques from a large number of ex-Scientologists, many from the upper echelons of the organization. Let us begin this half hour with the secretive and controversial Church of Scientology. In a moment, a defector from that church's leadership corps will speak out in an exclusive live interview. Behind me is the ornate world headquarters of the Church of Scientology. This morning, a member is breaking ranks and silence and telling stories of finances, abortions, and mind control. Now, Albert, as I said, was getting more and more insane. He formed, I, I could see a Nazi cult for me. And that's what they do to people. They take their private confessional folders, and they'll take anything they've confessed to, and they'll use it to try, to try to shut them up. The totalitarian leader of this paramilitary cult lives there in an armored building and often travels in an armored car. With copyrighted policies of terror and psychoterror... Former official spokesman and head of the Office of Special Affairs has left, bringing its secrets with him. People are not able to think for themselves, where they really are being suppressed, where they're being abused. Because the problem is the government isn't doing anything about these abuses, which have been systematic and they've been going on for decades. I was speaking about the child dianetics, the philosophy of Alvin Hubbard, that children aren't actually children, but they're billion-year-old beings occupying smaller bodies than the rest of us, and they should be responsible for just as much as the rest of us. And this sort of madness. She is one of Scientology's top global leaders, part of the inner circle, a confidant to its top stars. Now we can reveal she has been accused of covering up child sex abuse. I was introduced to Scientology when I was two years old. I eventually went to their boarding schools in the desert of California, you're under watch. And you undergo daily interrogations with their version of a lie detector. As far as I understand, the, the, one of the major purposes of a government is to protect the people. And uh, Scientology is, uh, in my opinion, quite, quite dangerous. But what none of these critiques and exposés examines is the social and political condition in which Scientology began. my relationship to this completely straight, so on. I am the writer of the textbooks of Scientology. About two and a half years ago or so, I even ceased to be a director of organizations. The government, in the first place, I am not. L. Ron Hubbard's self-help book, Dianetics, was first published in 1950, out of which grew the first Church of Scientology, incorporated in New Jersey in December of 1953, the California Scientology Church would follow two months later, in February of 1954. With its claims of using newly discovered technology and methods to fix humanity and help people develop greater powers of mind, it can be seen as the first step of a movement that was about to explode on the scene in the U.S. The Human Potential Movement. And at precisely the same time that the Human Potential Movement was beginning to form in the 1950s, the CIA began Project MKUltra in an effort to discover mind control techniques by subjecting mental health patients to electroshock therapy, various forms of torture and abuse, and drugs such as LSD. Using unknowing Canadian citizens as test subjects, Cameron had developed a new procedure which caught the eye of the MKUltra researchers 
as well as the Canadian intelligence community. He was hired by the CIA and the Canadian government to further explore the treatment, which he called psychic driving. First, Cameron proposed that they would use intensive electroshock and LSD and other disorienting drugs to, in his terms, depattern individuals, basically to wipe the slate clean. The 60s would see the human potential movement come to fruition, adopting methods of mind expansion that involved the use of the same drugs the CIA was using for mind control in MKUltra. The widespread use of LSD in the human potential movement can be traced back to one man who coincidentally also had the last name Hubbard and who, like L. Ron Hubbard, was fixated on an image of himself as a ship's captain, Alfred Matthew Hubbard. Like L. Ron Hubbard, Alfred Hubbard had a tendency to make grandiose claims about himself and his past, such as an alleged angelic vision as a young boy in which he was given the secret to building a radioactive battery, a virtual free energy device. A similar angelic vision would inspire him to introduce leaders and social visionaries around the world to LSD, earning him the nickname the Johnny Appleseed of LSD. Alfred Hubbard gave LSD to leading scientists, politicians, artists, writers, and even church officials. What was not widely known at the time was that Alfred Hubbard was a former OSS agent and likely current CIA agent, who at the very least corresponded with MKUltra mind control researchers. By some accounts, Alfred Hubbard personally administered LSD to as many as 6,000 people around the world. Amongst them were Timothy Leary, who would encourage the youth of America to turn on, tune in, and drop out, and the author of Brave New World, Aldous Huxley. Ironically, Huxley, whose book Brave New World envisioned a dystopian future of slavery of the masses through the administration of a state-produced drug called Soma, the effects of which are uncannily similar to LSD, would become the inspiration for the widespread use of LSD in the human potential movement. The use of LSD then spread into the streets of America's cities, providing an often bizarre sideshow that distracted mainstream attention away from the civil rights movement and left much of America's youth burnt out and brain damaged, working directly against the stated goals of increasing human potential. The effects on the mind are explosively disrupted. The reaction to the drug is completely unpredictable. It can be the hoped for heaven or a hell full of horror. In a similar vein, the women's liberation movement of the 1960s was infiltrated and redirected by an admitted CIA asset named Gloria Steinem. Steinem spent years suppressing knowledge of her CIA connections, finally not only admitting them publicly, but taking pride in them. Steinem referred to her CIA work in Europe, informing on and disrupting youth movements as the CIA's finest hour. In the 1970s, the next phase of so-called human potential research began with CIA funding of psychic phenomena such as remote viewing experiments conducted by Hal Puthoff and Ingo Swan at the Stanford Research Institute, or SRI. Alfred Hubbard was also employed by SRI, and perhaps coincidentally, Puthoff and Swan were both high-level Scientologists. It's clear that the CIA devoted considerable assets to disrupting any possibility of a true revolution in human potential in the 1960s and 70s. And the formation of Scientology in the 50s was possibly the start of that disruption. But that is not the full story by any means. To understand more, we need to go to Europe. And we begin in France. In all of Europe, France would appear who have the lowest tolerance for any sort of cultic activity. But the actions of the French cult watchdog group Miveludes tells a different story. The name Miveludes is an acronym that translates to the Interministerial Mission for Monitoring and Combating Cultic Deviances. Miveludes' battle against so-called cultic deviances is so vigorous that they have come under repeated fire for human rights abuses and for working against not only the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but even the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Perhaps if Miveludes actually fought against clear cases of abusive cults, such as Scientology, their existence might be justified. But exactly the opposite is true. Miveludes does not actually put up any sort of meaningful fight against established cults like Scientology. Instead, it goes after small groups and individuals that adopt alternative lifestyles that are outside the scope of what the state considers acceptable. 
Take, for example, this statement from Evolute's 2008 report on cultic deviance. Repression by the state is necessary if a certain number of criteria are satisfied. And the first of those criteria listed is, one or more people start to believe in certain ideas which differ from the ideas generally accepted by society. That same report states that in previous reports, Mivaludes had insisted on the fact that belief in Satan is not a source of concern. Its focus is exclusively on the deviations originating in the ideas and concepts enshrined by the Satanic movement. This report confirms that point. What sorts of things does Mivaludes see as deviant and in need of state repression? In their 2007 report, they quote the Court of Appeal of Lyon on Scientology. Purification therapies presented as aiming to improve the spiritual and physical condition of a person via sauna sessions and physical exertion, in particular running, dieting and taking vitamins, could represent an amalgamation of groundless affirmations and surreal hypotheses and be effective in the context of mental manipulation with possible lethal consequences due to direct or indirect toxic effects. While Scientology is clearly an organization that uses mind control techniques and hypnosis to manipulate its members, why do both the Cour de Lyon and Nivaludes specify as abnormal behavior in need of state repression one of the few things that Scientology does that is actually beneficial? According to Nivaludes director, George Fenech, everything that is natural can be suspected as a cult. Not only does the French organization Mivaludes single out exercise and proper nutrition as dangerous Scientology practices, they have waged a virtual war against those who practice all forms of alternative health in France, including individuals and organizations practicing yoga, tai chi, meditation, those taking vitamin supplements, and organic farmers. Even suspicion of such alternative lifestyle choices in France can lead to the state removing children from their homes. And as Mivaludes continues to shut down businesses and take children from their parents for exploring legitimate lifestyle alternatives, Scientology is given a virtual free pass. In the most recent lawsuit against Scientology in France, the law that would have allowed for shutting down French Scientology operations completely was conveniently repealed before it could be applied to Scientology. There is, in fact, a long history of protection of Scientology in France. The Paris Law Courts, 28 kilometers of corridors, black robes, and files. And yet it happened. A full volume and a half of investigation notes vanished a few months ago. The case was against Scientology. But, as we found, this protection of Scientology is still only the tip of the iceberg. And it is an iceberg that descends into very dark and troubling waters. If French authorities such as Mivaludes are the ardent cult fighters they claim to be, why then do they steadfastly refuse to investigate this? A staggering number of claims of ritual child abuse across France tied to Satanism. Robert is one of many French children who have given testimony on ritual child abuse in France. Robert began nach und nach Sachen zu erzählen. Er sagte, ich habe es satt, zu Papa gehen zu müssen. Ich will nicht mehr zu ihm. Er ist böse. Als ich von Robert das Wort böse hörte, dachte ich erst, sein Vater behandle ihn schlecht. Was ganz schlimm und unglaublich an der Geschichte ist, er erzählte auch von Abenden, an denen sich Erwachsene trafen, die sich verkleiden, mit Mänteln und mit Masken. Und was mich an seinen Worten besonders schockierte, der Kleine sagte, Papa hat sich verkleidet, aber ich habe sofort seine Stimme erkannt. Und Robert sprach auch von Tieropfern, aber auch von Kindern. Despite the hardline position taken by Mivaludes on matters of natural health and organic food, their response to all claims of ritual child abuse is to ignore the claims completely. Robert sagt, sein Vater habe ihn mehrfach vergewaltigt. Trotz zahlreicher Zeugenaussagen und medizinischer Gutachten kommt es nicht zur Verhandlung. Die Justiz glaubt den Aussagen des Kindes nicht. Even in the face of photographic evidence. Wie 
wie viele andere Opfer berichtet auch Robert von Kameras. Wir finden seine Fotos auf den CD-ROMs von Sandford wieder. Fotos, auf denen Françoise ihren Sohn eindeutig identifiziert. When claims of discovery of tunnels used to perform child abuse rituals arise, the French authorities still refuse to raise a finger to investigate. Noemi berichtet mir von ungefähr zehn Kinderopfern in nur einem Jahr. Sie zeigt mir auf einem Plan, wo sich die Eingänge der Katakomben befinden. Bis heute wird die Existenz des Kellersystems von Saint Victor von der Justiz verleugnet. And when photographic evidence of these tunnels is produced, the photos and all related files are conveniently lost by the police. Ich war schon mehrmals in Saint Victor. Es gibt da unterirdische Gänge. Ich hatte damals die Gelegenheit, davon Fotos zu machen. Diese Fotos habe ich in die Hände des stellvertretenden Leiters der Polizei von Privas gegeben, Morin. Nein, entschuldigen Sie, Marron. Er sollte sie zu der Akte mit dem Protokoll meiner Anhörung legen. Diese Anhörung hatte ich im April 1999 bei der Polizei gemacht. Doch die Akte ist ganz plötzlich verschwunden. Weder die Fotos noch das Protokoll meiner Anhörung sind aufzufinden. Children making claims such as Robert's are all too common in France and all around Europe. Strikingly, children who could not possibly know each other or have exchanged information give the same testimony and identify the same perpetrators. C'est qu'il y a des lieux qui se croisent, c'est qu'il y a des témoignages qui se croisent, alors que ces jeunes femmes ne se connaissent pas. Elles ont vécu des choses avec des personnages identiques, parfois dans des lieux euh, identiques, et, et, et surtout des événements incroyables auxquels l'imagination euh, laisse pantois quand on pense à des chasses d'enfants euh, qu'on qu 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 laissait courir dehors, nus, qu'on essayait d'attraper, enfin des trucs, des horreurs. Et tout ça aurait été fait dans une société bourgeoise pour ne pas dire plus and perhaps here we can begin to understand why this kind of abuse is protected while Mivaludes prosecutes innocent people and takes children from their parents for living alternative lifestyles centered around improved physical and mental health warum passiert immer das gleiche warum werden die mutmaßlichen täter nicht zur verantwortung gezogen Jahrelange Recherchen führen mich immer wieder zu dieser einen Erklärung. Viele der Täter sind hochgestellte Persönlichkeiten, haben die Macht, sich gegenseitig zu schützen. Und es ist viel Geld, sehr viel Geld im Spiel. Noemi berichtet von Kindern, die vor laufender Kamera vergewaltigt, gefoltert und geopfert werden. Diese sogenannten Snuff-Videos kosten als Duplikat bis zu 20.000 Euro. Something is very wrong with this picture, and it does not stop in France. August 1996. Two missing girls are found alive in Belgium. The only two survivors of the man who had become known as the Beast of Belgium, Marc Dutru. As it turned out, this was not the first time Dutru had gone on such a rampage. In 1989, Dutru had been convicted of the kidnapping and rape of five young girls. We are absolutely positive that Dutru could have been arrested. Information comes to light. In 1989, six years before the disappearance of Julie Lejeune and Melissa Rousseau, Dutru and his wife had been convicted of the abduction and rape of five girls. Dutru was released just three years into a 13-year sentence released by the Belgian Minister of Justice, Melchior Watelet. Over the next few months, a series of devastating revelations emerge about Dutroux's past and his relationship to the country's authorities. Due to his previous conviction, Dutroux was a natural suspect for the more recent case of six missing girls and was subject to police investigation. But curiously, the Belgian police did everything they could to ignore evidence that Dutroux might be guilty including refusing to watch a confiscated videotape of Dutroux building a dungeon used to keep the girls he abducted. From his release in 1992, warning signs were flashing. A police informant claimed he was asked by Dutroux to help him kidnap a girl. Dutroux's own mother even tipped off police that her son may be hiding girls in his home.
eventually, in August 1995, the police put him under surveillance, an operation codenamed Othello. A camera was hidden in a railway wagon in front of his house in Marcinel. This camera was in front of the house the night that uh, Anne and Ephia were kidnapped. The problem was that uh, the truth chose to do this uh, kidnapping yeah, at night and the police turned off the camera uh, at 6 o'clock in the evening. Afterwards they tell us that for operational reasons this camera has only been turning from uh, 8 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock in the evening or something. This is very intelligent if you want to catch uh, someone, a pedophile kidnapping girls. The officer in charge of Operation Othello, René Michaud, visited the house in December 1995. Dutroux had recently been questioned about stolen cars, and investigators used this as an opportune moment to search his house. Also present was a locksmith, Alain Lejeune, who was accompanying the police in their search. Suddenly, children's voices are heard. He hears these voices and this discussion starts. Did you hear that? No, ce sont des enfants dehors. Oui, ils jouent dehors. Ah non, ce bruit vient de l'intérieur. Écoutez, c'est clair. Silence. Non, et puis, puis c'est qui le policier ici? Allez, on y va. The locksmith said, I heard voices and it was absolutely clear that they came from there, from two meters from where we, st where we were standing. The voices are Melissa Rousseau and Julie Lejeune. Three months later, they were dead. Do not forget that this Julia Melissa disappearance was the top story in Belgium. That was the absolutely the top priority of police. Uh, at least that's what they told us. Michaud found video cassettes during his search. They didn't watch the tapes. The explanation afterwards that they didn't have a, a video player. On one of these tapes, we can see Mark Dutroux constructing his, his cage. The explanation of where it was and how it was constructed was, was on tape. They just had to watch it, but they had no video player. There again, that's official version. Sorry, I don't buy it. And at the same time, according to the highly regarded French children's advocate Marie-France Botte, the Belgian Ministry of Justice withheld a politically sensitive list of customers of pedophile videotapes. An eventual parliamentary inquiry into the Dutroux case produced a list of 30 Belgian officials guilty of negligence and corruption. Amongst those on the list was Justice Minister Watelet. Watelet was once again promoted, this time to the European Court of Justice. The fact that the Belgian government had clearly worked to protect Dutroux sparked what Wikipedia euphemistically refers to as a number of shortcomings in the Dutroux investigation that caused widespread discontent in Belgium with the country's criminal justice system. In fact, the revelations of government complicity in Dutroux's pedophile network nearly sparked a full-scale revolution. Again and again, we find the same story, the same pattern of protection of those committing unimaginable abuse, refusal of authorities to investigate, and harassment of those who attempt to expose the abuse. What is the purpose of organizations like Mivaludes if they allow this kind of abuse to continue in the face of overwhelming evidence that it exists? D'autant qu'à chaque fois, il apporte des preuves. Il révèle une réalité effrayante. Des gens qui travaillent à la réalisation d'un catalogue d'enfants en lien avec des studios de photographie spécialisés dans la pornographie. Derrière des disparitions d'enfants se profile la réalité d'un réseau et d'étranges protections et la commercialisation d'images de viols d'enfants. Regina Louf is a survivor of the pedophilia ring that Mark Dutroux was a part of and one of the few who was willing to testify and who lived to do so. In 1996, this woman came forward to tell the Belgian authorities she'd spent her childhood years as the victim of a paedophile network. She described a world of organized sexual abuse, torture, and even murder. 
Her testimony showed that she knew details of unsolved murders that would not have been possible without access to police files. In one of her testimonies, she explained how a certain person had been murdered in a certain place. I remember it like it's a film in my head. I can close my eyes and see every little detail of that house she was murdered, where she was murdered. She gave us some details that made us think that it's impossible to give without having been there at that place or without having yeah, lived that in the way the body was found at that time and the way she described the person was, was, was killed. All of her testimony checked out. She was even able to describe the inside of the house in which a ritual murder had taken place, a strangely designed house, the details of which she could not possibly know unless she had been there. The credibility of Regina Loof's testimony hinged partly on whether she really knew the house where Christine Van Hees was killed. This man grew up there, though his family sold it before the murder. It was two houses knocked into one, with a unique passage of stairs and corridors. No one, he says, could describe it unless they'd been there. There was the corridor here, between the two houses, and she drew a picture of the doors inside. They were antique doors, and she drew the mouldings. She described the wallpaper and the front step. I don't know how she could have described it all so faithfully, if she'd never entered the house. The response of Belgian authorities? The investigators were removed from the case. But then out of the blue, the investigation was stopped. We received a message that we couldn't investigate and went just like that. We were sent home. Just like that. Without an explanation. And the Belgian government, with the full complicity of the media, declared Regina Loof a liar. Madame, Monsieur, bonsoir. L'affaire du trou s'est enrichie. The flagship program of the government funded French language channel was unequivocal. De Batz was guilty, they declared, and Regina Loof, a sinister and deranged liar. I think Regina Loof is a pathological liar. She's a woman who's invented scenarios that don't stand up to scrutiny. It's all been shown to be fiction. That should come as no surprise. Regina Loof's testimony went far beyond what anyone could imagine. Sexual torture and abuse that can only be described as unhuman conducted at the factory of Belgian arms manufacturer ASCO. Loof called this the factory of the video recordings and gave names of those taking part in the videotaped torture and murder of children there. Among those named was Belgian Justice Minister Melchior Watelet, the man responsible for the early release from prison of Marc Dutroux, and the man who would go on to support the creation of an anti-cult task force like Niveludes in Belgium. The pattern continues, and still the perpetrators are protected by government authorities. I think this is one of the most important court cases for children in the country. Absolutely. Um, basically, a decision was made in a court that Holly Gregg was not competent. This is after the police originally said that she was competent, and that was uh, recorded in writing. A reliable, competent witness, a judge, then ruled she's not comp uh, competent. The judge had no medical or expert opinion to rely on, and he, uh, sorry, she, she was not uh, qualified herself. Because, because she has Down syndrome. They're saying that she's not competent, even though she was competent. Well, they, they, they're not using any evidence. They're making an arbitrary decision, and of course why they want that decision is they want to undermine her as a credible witness in the horrific child abuse, and, uh, rape and sexual assault that she suffered. And who, and were, this, who, do, who, who, who were the perpetrators? Well, we know the perpetrators were members of the Scottish uh, uh, legal establishment. They included sheriffs, police, uh, social services people. And but the key bit is, this is the state blatantly attempting to silence this little girl, well, young lady now, by taking her away from her mother. Even more child abuse is discovered, this time on the tax haven island of Jersey, between England and France. Panorama now on BBC One reporting on the recent allegations of child abuse in Jersey. For the first time we report from inside Oak de la Garenne as Jersey's children's homes begin to give up their secrets. Allegations of child abuse that were related to a wider pedophile network. Back in Jersey we joined the team now tracing a web of information connecting Haute de la Garenne with a number of other children's homes. 
From the 50s to the 90s, young people passed from institution to institution, and in some cases, the staff they feared moved too. Allegations that would be met with the same predictable response. We'll speak to two politicians from the island now. One of them is Senator Stuart Sivray, and he's the former health minister who says he was sacked for blowing the whistle on all this. We know that this has taken place. And back in the U.S., the pattern is the same. One such pedophile network in the U.S. centered around Nebraska Republican Party leader and general manager of Omaha's Franklin Federal Credit Union, Lawrence King. This is the true story of Lawrence King. It is the story of an evil at the heart of America of a cover-up at the highest level. It's a web of intrigue that starts in our holy of holies, Boys Town, Nebraska, one of the most respected institutions in the United States, and spreads out like a spider web to Washington, D.C., right up to the steps of the nation's capital, the steps of the White House, involves some of the most respected and powerful and richest businessmen in this United States of America, and the centerpiece of the entire web is the use of children for sex and drug dealing and drug couriers, the compromising of politicians, the compromising of businessmen, but worst of all, the corruption of key institutions of government that have the duty and responsibility to make sure these things never happen. Once again, those involved enjoy the protection of the courts. On the trail of Craig Spence, DeCamp finds the investigative reporter who exposed Spence's callboy network, Paul Rodriguez of the Washington Times. We had uh, uncovered uh, a series of allegations from some miners that led me to a callboy operation here in Washington. This is the thing that always bothered me. They claimed it was the largest uh, male prostitution ring in the city that they've ever, ever had uncovered. It was a million dollars a year minimum. Yeah. And yet they only prosecuted the operator, uh, Henry Vinson, and three of his lieutenants, as it were. Mm -hmm. They never went after any of the Johns or the clients. This operation, which was, again, quite large, claimed to have clients that ran from the White House to the Capitol Hill to the State House to the churches to, in, within the media. Um, and that's and precisely a lot of the, what Paul describes as the people he was with. And a lot of the stuff led there, but we couldn't quite nail it at all cases because, again, to accuse someone of high yeah. stature, you've got to be very careful. I understand. We were able to do it through the, uh, the mother load which provided us credit card receipts and canceled checks and then um, lists of the clients. The prosecutors knew all this stuff. There was approximately 20,000 pieces of do or 20, documents yes. that they had. They sealed the entire record when they found out I was accessing them. They required consent agreements from all the lawyers, all the clients, all the relatives of all the clients, all the hookers, including the clients themselves. Which means you can never gain access. They sealed them by court order. And we have tried, to, we've attempted on several occasions to unseal that, and we've been told it will be a cold day in hell before those records ever get unsealed. And it makes me wonder what's in those records. Yeah. While those who attempted to bring the abuse to light suffered harassment and even death. As Gary Caradori and Karen Ormiston sought out new witnesses on the streets of Omaha, they found themselves under constant threat. Gary was threatened several times. His, his vehicles were tampered with. I would think whoever tampered with them, um, it was a scare tactic because it was so obvious. He told us about this book, it was, it was like addresses, telephone numbers, names. He said if, if, they, uh, if they knew he had it, they'd kill him. On July the 11th, 1990, Gary Caradori and his eight-year-old son, AJ, were flying home from Chicago. They had watched the All-Stars baseball game, and Caradori had been pursuing new leads. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board are in Harold Cameron's cornfield trying to determine what caused this private plane to crash, killing its two occupants. The bodies of Gary Caradori and eight-year-old AJ were found in the wreckage. National Transportation Safety Board investigators say wreckage from the crash is apparently strewn over a three-quarter to one-mile-long stretch in this field. The, the fact that the wreckage is scattered over a large area 
certainly demonstrates that it did break up in flight. The exact mechanism of breakup yet is still unknown. The federal investigation was never able to discover what tore the plane apart. More witnesses would either be killed, harassed by the FBI and law enforcement, or sent to prison for testifying about what had happened to them. And then there is this, the strange case of Henry Lee Lucas, a drifter who claimed to belong to a cannibalistic satanic cult called the Hand of Death, and who may or may not have been the most prolific serial killer in history. Lucas was arrested for unlawful possession of a firearm in Texas in 1983. Once in custody, he confessed to the murder of both 82-year-old Kate Rich and his underaged girlfriend Becky Powell. In a bizarre twist, while in court, Lucas then spontaneously confessed to killing even more women. What followed was a law enforcement and media circus in which Lucas confessed to literally every unsolved murder in the U.S. that was brought before him. A number of murders that, if he had committed them, would have outnumbered all other serial killers in history combined. But were these confessions real? By the time the circus died down, a total of 214 unsolved murder cases from around the country had been closed, all pinned on Lucas, without forensic evidence to back them up. Lucas was used as a virtual, lone-crazed gunman to wipe as many mysterious murders as possible around the country off the books. Lucas's background and confessions had all of the hallmarks of someone subjected to mind control. As a child, he was severely beaten and repeatedly exposed to his mother working as a prostitute. And during the confessions, Lucas was kept compliant by being drugged. Lucas would eventually recant most of his confessions. While there was no doubt that Lucas was responsible for many murders and was certainly not someone who should be left to walk the streets, it also became clear that Lucas was a pathological liar with a severely fractured ego from childhood abuse and drugs, being set up as a patsy. Then, days before he was scheduled to be put to death, the case took the most bizarre turn of all. He was brought to trial and sentenced to death in the state of Texas, while George W. Bush was governor of that state. George Bush was notorious for rejecting requests for stays of execution. In fact, Bush held the record for the greatest number of executions of any state in the U.S. by the time he left office. The first woman to be executed in Texas in over 100 years, Carla Faye Tucker, was killed while Bush was governor. Bush even went so far as to laugh at and mock Tucker's pleas for her life. He then executed another woman two years later, 62-year-old great-grandmother Betty Lou Beats. And while Beats did appear to be guilty of the murder she was charged with, there was simply no reason to put her to death. At her age, she could have been locked up for life at a fraction of the cost of the state of an execution. But so was the nature of Texas under Bush. If someone could be executed, they were executed. In fact, during his time as governor of Texas, George Bush intervened to stay only one death sentence. That of self-proclaimed Satanist, cannibal, and mass murderer, Henry Lee Lucas. This sort of protection of pedophiles, rapists, mass murderers, and abusive cults, while at other times prosecuting and harassing innocent people suspected of simply living alternative lifestyles, or carrying out cruel and unnecessary death sentences that do not serve justice, does leave one wondering, just what is going on? Perhaps, part of the answer has something to do with this. In her book, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, Naomi Klein exposes a pattern of bringing the people of the world under the domination of a few large corporations through the exploitation of people shocked by disaster, such as the U.S.-backed overthrow of democratically elected leaders of foreign countries to replace them with murderous and brutal dictators. As Klein points out in her book, this was the case with the democratically elected president of Chile, Salvador Allende. Allende was overthrown by a CIA-backed coup and replaced by the ruthless and murderous Augusto Pinochet. Under the CIA-backed rule of Pinochet, thousands of Chileans were either publicly murdered by the government or simply disappeared without a trace. And conveniently, 
Pinochet also implemented sweeping economic reforms that proved disastrous for Chile, but profitable for U.S. corporations. But the plan to literally shock the people of the world into submission clearly goes beyond the obvious disasters and political upheavals that Klein points out in her book. The Mark de True affair was used to reorganize the Belgian justice system, including a push for the creation of a cult watchdog group like Mima Lutz. Henry Lee Lucas was used both to horrify the public and as a scapegoat to pin a variety of mysterious murders on. The pedophile prostitution ring run by Lawrence King, using children from Boys Town, was used not only to serve the twisted needs of political and corporate elites, but to blackmail politicians into supporting policies and laws that benefited these same elites. These are only a few examples of the unimaginable sickness that appears to pervade all governments on the planet. These cases are not merely incidents of bad people achieving positions of power. They are the norm. The sickness is systemic. The abuse seems to bear all of the hallmarks of a vast counterintelligence program for gaining more power over the minds and lives of the public. Given the virtually identical pattern of abuse and protection in both the U.S. and in Europe, organizations like Miva Lutz appear increasingly like protectors of the abusers, not the public. Aside from the connections to all of this that we have already explored, there is another key connection between Scientology and these cults of abuse. Satanism. The essence of so-called black magic is gaining power over other people. This is also what is behind all mind control programs, ritual child abuse, and Scientology. The Nazis' interest in magic and the occult is also well documented and directly related to their search for ways of gaining the greatest possible control over the populace and gaining power. Immediately after World War II, many of these same Nazi researchers interested in the use of the occult to gain control and power were secretly brought to the U.S. to continue their research via Operation Paperclip. Operation Paperclip was officially approved in August of 1945. Perhaps coincidentally, the genesis of Dianetics seems to trace back to that same year. The official Scientology biography of Hubbard states that, in 1945, he was left partially blind with injured optic nerves and lame from hip and back injuries, and that Mr. Hubbard was hospitalized at Oak Knoll Naval Hospital in Oakland, California. Allegedly, he then spent the next years healing himself by applying the principles that would become the foundation for his 1950 book, Dianetics, the book that gave rise to the Church of Scientology. However, in an earlier interview quoted on the Scientology site ronthepoet.com, Hubbard gives a very different account of that time, saying, I spent the last year of my naval career in a naval hospital. Not very ill, but I had a couple of holes in me. They wouldn't heal, so they just kept me. What neither the official biography nor this earlier interview mentions is the fact that Hubbard, after leaving the hospital, moved in with self-taught chemist, rocket scientist, and co-founder of JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, Jack Parsons. Parsons was not only a brilliant rocket scientist, he was a self-proclaimed Satanist, black magician, and avid follower of Aleister Crowley, a British Satanist who dubbed himself the Beast 666. Parsons had dubbed himself the Antichrist. In 1945, Hubbard moved in with Parsons and they became very close friends. Together, in 1946, they performed a magical ritual called the Babylon Working intended to give a physical incarnation to the so-called Whore of Babylon, or Mother of Abominations. The Babylon working was a sex magic ritual, in which L. Ron Hubbard played the part of High Priest, as Parsons had sex with a young girl. Curiously, Hubbard was allegedly a neophyte in Satanism and magic when Parsons gave him the role of High Priest in this ceremony. Parsons wrote to Crowley that, Although Hubbard has no formal training in magic, he has an extraordinary amount of experience and understanding in the field. Clearly, there is far more to L. Ron Hubbard's history than is covered in his official biography. Following the completion of the Babylon working by Parsons and Hubbard, Parsons again wrote to Crowley, exclaiming, Babylon is incarnate upon the earth today, awaiting the proper hour of her manifestation. And in that day, my work will be accomplished 
and I shall be blown away upon the breath of the Father, even as it is prophesied. In yet another strange coincidence, Parsons was literally blown away six years later by an explosion in his home laboratory, immediately following Hubbard's announcement of the foundation of Scientology. Foul play has been suspected, but one can't help but wonder if Parsons blew himself away to fulfill the prophecy once he saw the mother of abominations incarnate in the world as Hubbard's new Scientology movement. All of this tends to lend credence to the claim of Hubbard's son, Rhonda Wolfe, that Scientology is actually black magic. Really the basis of Scientology, which is rather hidden and covered over, is uh, the occult, uh, the uh, uh, deep involvement with uh, satanic uh, powers that he felt that uh, he was deeply involved with uh, uh, a uh, British uh, black magician called Alistair Crowley uh, and through putting himself in deep hypnotic trances and the use of drugs on himself he wanted to become the most powerful being in the world. This is further supported by the obvious relationship of Scientology symbols to occult symbols. The main Scientology symbol appears to be a variation on the central symbol of the Brotherhood of Luxor. And the Scientology cross bears more than a passing resemblance to the cross that adorns the back of Aleister Crowley's tarot cards. But perhaps the strongest evidence that Hubbard's Scientology is an attempt to apply principles of black magic and satanic worship to mass manipulation of the public comes from his own lips. Uh, he could simply say, I have action. A magician, uh, the magic cults of the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries in the Middle East were fascinating. The only modern work that has anything to do with them is a trifle wild in spots, but it's fascinating work in itself, and that's work written by Alastair Crowley, the late Alastair Crowley, my very good friend. Nazi mind control scientists brought to the U.S. via Operation Paperclip, the introduction of drugs into social movements and onto the streets, the infiltration and subversion of the human potential and women's liberation movements by the CIA, the destruction of the civil rights movement, the rise of satanic worship taking the forms of child abuse cults, pedophilia, and the modified black magic of Scientology, and the protection of and distraction away from all of these by courts and government groups like Nivaludes. Examining this evidence, the following picture emerges. Seeing the possibility of a widespread change in values beginning with the growing civil rights movement, a massive counterintelligence program was launched. The purpose of this program would be the infiltration, subversion, and misdirection of all groups and movements that might contribute to this change in values. Once the civil rights movement had been stopped, and all other movements had been subverted, the specter of cults, and more recently, terrorists, along with institutionally sponsored abuse, was used to coerce the public into accepting greater levels of governmental control of their lives. And organizations like Mivaludes, were then created to protect those committing institutional abuse and battle against those attempting to expose or heal the effects of this abuse, all under the guise of protecting the public. We encourage you to examine this evidence for yourself. And if you reach conclusions similar to ours, we also ask you to think, do you want to live in a world ruled by abusive and psychopathic monsters?